In the story of the emperor and his new clothes, you have a man who walks around completely naked and exposed. All the meanwhile, he thinks he's wearing the finest of suits. And there's many believers today who are just like that man. They're walking around thinking that they're covered in the imputed righteousness of Christ. And they say that God doesn't see them when they sin. All the meanwhile, God sees them exactly as they are, as nothing is hid from his omniscient eye, but all things are exposed to him. There are many in the church today who believe that they are right with God while they continue in their sin. They try and comfort themselves in their impenitence by saying, I'm righteous before God in my position, even though I am unrighteous in my practice. But the Apostle John refuted this whole idea when he said this, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. 1 John 3, 7. So the idea that you can be righteous in your position while you remain unrighteous in your practice, according to the Apostle John, is a deception. You see, Jesus didn't die so that we could just continue to practice unrighteousness. Jesus died so that we could practice righteousness. As the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 8, in verse 3, he says, God sending his own son. And then in verse 4 he says, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So Jesus Christ came that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Backsliders in Israel were saying this according to Ezekiel 8.12, The Lord seeth us not. And backsliders in the church today are saying the exact same thing. I can't count how many times I've heard people say in church, when God looks at me, He doesn't see me. He doesn't see my sin. He sees the righteousness of Christ instead. This type of talk really ought to be shocking to our ears, and yet it's commonplace in the church. This theological nonsense, which is a blatant denial of God's omniscience, is refuted all throughout the Bible. The Lord looketh from heaven, he beholdeth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashioneth their hearts alike. He considereth all their works. Psalms 33, 13 to 15. For the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Proverbs 15:3. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Hebrews 4.13 You see, Jesus Christ did not come to somehow blind God or to take away his omniscience. God's not some big idiot in the sky who doesn't know what's going on. But when God spoke to the churches in Revelation, he didn't say, I look at you and see the perfect imputed righteousness of Christ. He said, I know your works. And he said, be zealous therefore and repent. But those who are unwilling to repent of their sins are fooling themselves by saying, God doesn't even see my sins. Charles Kingsley said, I am sure I have seen people read books and run about to sermons in order to enable them to forget those Ten Commandments, in order to find excuses for not keeping them, and to find doctrines which tell them that, because Christ has done all, they need do nothing. Do you think your sins are washed away in Christ's blood when they are still, and you're committing them? Would they be there and you doing them if they were put away? Do you think that your sins can be put away out of God's sight if they are not even put out of your own sight? If you are doing wrong, and do you think that God will treat you as if you are doing right? Cannot God see in you what you see in yourselves? Do you think that a man can be clothed in Christ's righteousness at the very same time that he is clothed in his own unrighteousness? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. What a man sows, that shall he reap. He that doeth righteousness is righteous 
even as Christ is righteous and no one else. George Otis Jr. said, The theological doctrine of imputed righteousness has been grossly distorted in our day. We are told that God looks at us through the blood of Christ and sees us as righteous, regardless of our actual state. Let's stop kidding ourselves. God sees us exactly the way we are. If we are living in obedience, He sees it. If we are living selfish, unholy lives, we can be sure He sees that too. In the book of Revelation, when God was speaking to the churches, He never said, I see you and I see the perfect righteousness of Christ, or when I look upon you, I see the imputed righteousness of Jesus. Rather, He said, I know thy works. And He said, Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And therefore, those in the church should not comfort themselves in their impenitence or comfort themselves in their sin by appealing to imputed righteousness. They should simply repent. But many are trying to replace repentance onto holiness with the doctrine of the imputed righteousness of Christ. In fact, the words of Jesus Christ are often referred to as an appeal to the need for the imputed righteousness of Christ. Jesus said, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of Matthew 5.20. When interpreting the Bible, it's a rule of hermeneutics to look at the context of a passage. And when we look at the context of this passage, it gives us insight as to what Jesus meant by our righteousness exceeding that of the scribes and the Pharisees. He said, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment, and whoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Matthew 5, 21-22 Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Matthew 5, 27-28 The scribes and the Pharisees were under the law of Moses, but Christians are under the law of Christ. And the law of Christ is even stricter than the law of Moses. In this way, our righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. But to use this passage to teach that we need the imputed righteousness of Christ is to overlook one of the most basic principles of exegesis, which is to interpret a passage by its context. You see, Jesus was not saying that we can be right with God in our position even while we remain unrighteous in our practice. But he was saying that unless we become pure in heart and obedient in heart, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. To say that we need the imputed righteousness of Christ to be transferred to our account in order to be justified is to say that the atonement of Jesus Christ is not enough or that it's not sufficient for our justification. It's very important that we understand that we don't need any imputed works of the law from Christ in order to be justified, but that if we repent and believe, we are justified by God's grace and mercy through the atonement of Jesus. You see, if God looked at our account and saw that it was perfect and spotless, there would be no grace in our justification. Justification by works of the law is when the law declares someone to be innocent because their record is proven to be spotless. But justification by grace is when a person's record shows that they are guilty and deserving of punishment, and yet they're forgiven and pardoned anyways. And so if God looked at our account and saw that we were perfect and spotless because we received imputed works of the law from Christ, then we are justified by works of the law apart from grace. But if God looks at our account and sees that we are guilty, He sees that we are deserving of punishment, and yet He forgives us and pardons us anyways, 
then we are justified by grace apart from works of the law. This is what the Bible means when it says in Romans 4, 5, He justifieth the ungodly. You see, if God looks at us, and instead of seeing the perfect imputed righteousness of Christ, but if He sees that we're guilty and deserving of punishment, then being justified by Him is truly a matter of grace, because it's unmerited, undeserved, and unearned. You see, we're not justified by the works of the law at all, the works of the law from ourselves, or works of the law from Christ. Christ died on the cross for us, but He did not obey the law for us. In fact, to say that we need the imputed works of the law of Christ to be transferred to our account in order to be justified is actually to say that the atonement, His suffering and death at Calvary, is not enough, that it's not sufficient for our justification. But because we are justified by God's grace through the atonement, we don't need Christ's works of the law to be transferred to us in order to be justified. Now we are imputed righteous through Christ, but we do not receive the imputed righteousness of Christ. And that distinction is properly understood when we have a biblical understanding of what imputed righteousness actually is. The New Testament word for imputed is translated as think, counted, reckoned, accounted, reckon, suppose, account, accounting, conclude, count, esteemeth, impute, imputeth, imputing, laid, numbered, reasoned, thinkest, thinketh, and thought. When an individual is imputed righteous, it simply means that their sins are forgiven and they are now thought of as righteous, they're esteemed as righteous, counted as righteous, reckoned as righteous, considered as righteous. When a person is imputed as righteous, they are treated as if they were always righteous, treated as if they were never unrighteous, and being treated as if they were always law-abiding citizens. The Old Testament equivalent word for imputed is translated as counted, thought, think, accounted, imagine, esteemed, reckoned, count, reckon, counteth, imagined, imputed, account, considered, esteem, esteemeth, imagineth, impute, imputeth, reckoning, regard, regardeth, thinkest, and thinketh. To be imputed righteous is to be counted as righteous, thought of as righteous, esteemed as righteous, to be reckoned as righteous, considered as righteous, or regarded as righteous. The word imputed does not mean transferred. It's a theological error to say that the righteousness of Christ is transferred to our account. You see, if imputed meant transferred, then in Romans 2.26, when an uncircumcised man is imputed as circumcised, that would mean that someone else's circumcision is transferred to them. But the obvious meaning of this passage is that even though they are uncircumcised, they are treated and regarded and thought of as if they were circumcised. And in the same way, when we are imputed righteous, it doesn't mean someone else's righteousness is transferred to us, but that even though we have lived unrighteously, we are regarded and treated and thought of as if we had always been righteous. Now some people try and represent the doctrine of the imputed righteousness of Christ as the gospel itself. But if the doctrine of imputed righteousness of Christ is the gospel, then Jesus Christ and the apostles never preached the gospel. See, the Bible nowhere teaches the doctrine of the imputed righteousness of Christ. The Bible abundantly talks about imputed righteousness, but not the imputed righteousness of Christ. You see, we do receive imputed righteousness through Christ, but we do not receive the imputed righteousness of Christ. John Wesley said, it is nowhere stated in the scriptures that Christ's personal righteousness is imputed to us. Not a text can be found 
which contains any enunciation of the doctrine. The doctrine of the imputed righteousness of Christ is a myth. It's pure myth. It's not taught anywhere in the Bible. In fact, biblical imputed righteousness is nothing more than forgiveness. It's when your sins are not held against you. We know this because when the Apostle Paul was describing imputed righteousness, he quoted from the book of Psalms that describes imputed righteousness as forgiveness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Romans 4, 5-8 Imputed righteousness according to the Bible, according to the inspired psalmist and the inspired apostle, is when our iniquities are forgiven and our sins are covered. Plain and simple. You see, the righteousness of God is the unmerited forgiveness that we receive from Him through the atonement. But this, of course, only occurs when we have a living and obedient faith, when we actually turn from our sins and forsake our wickedness. God only forgives our sins when we repent of our sins. God only pardons our wickedness when we turn away from our wickedness. So no man is imputed righteous, or no man is forgiven while they continue to practice unrighteousness, while they continue to live in sin. Asbury Lowry said, This passage, Romans 4, 5-8, deserves special attention, as it explains all those texts that seem to favor and have been construed to support the theory of the imputation of Christ's active and passive righteousness to the sinner. Here it is manifest that justification, imputation of righteousness, forgiving iniquities, covering sins, and the non-imputation of sin are phrases substantially of the same import and decide positively that the scripture's view of the great doctrine under consideration is an actual deliverance from the guilt and penalty of sin, from which it follows that the phrase is so often occurring in the writings of Paul, the righteousness of God and of Christ, must mean God's righteous method of justifying the ungodly through the atonement and by the instrumentality of faith, a method that upholds the rectitude of the divine character at the same time that it offers a full and free pardon to the sinner. Charles Finney said, The doctrine of a literal imputation of Christ's obedience or righteousness is supported by those who hold it by such passages as the following. Romans 4, 5-8 But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. But here, justification is represented only as consisting in forgiveness of sin or in pardon and acceptance. Again, 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 21. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. For he has made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Here again the Apostle is teaching only his much-loved doctrine of justification by faith, in the sense that upon condition or in consideration of the death and mediatorial interference and work of Christ, penitent believers in Christ are forgiven and rewarded as if they were righteous. So we clearly see that in the Bible, Imputed righteousness is the forgiveness of sins. It's when our sins are not reckoned and considered and thought of and held against us, but that we are reckoned, considered, and thought of as righteous, when we are treated and regarded as if we have never sinned. 
And so that when we repent of our sins and turn from our sins, God treats us and regards us as righteous even though we've been unrighteous. But to say that we are covered by the imputed righteousness of Christ while we're impenitent and continue on in our sins is to greatly misunderstand what the Bible teaches on imputed righteousness. To believe that we are covered by the imputed righteousness of Christ while we continue to sin, while we continue in our impenitence, would make us nothing more than the emperor walking around in his new clothes when in reality he's naked and exposed.